A pleasant good morning, everyone, and welcome to the press conference on the COVID-19 virus. With us today, we have the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sharon Belna-George. We have the National Epidem Nas Acting National Epidemiologist, Dr. Dana de Costa Gomez, and also the Director of the Ezra Long Lab, Dr. Wayne Felicia. Welcome. First, we will have Dr. Sharon Belna-George, who will give us a brief introduction. Good morning to all. Um, let me thank my colleagues for being here with me um, today. I think it's important that a holistic view of our system is here present to ensure that any information that you have is well covered. I want to recognize and thank the, the members of the, the media um, as you are an extremely important stakeholder as we manage um, COVID-19 and other health-related um, illnesses. I just want to thank you for the support to ensure that um, accurate information to ensure positive behavior change is noted through our communities as we manage our, our wave at this point. Um, this morning, we thought it important as we note we are in a new critical position for COVID-19 we thought it important that we present to you and to the public our progress so far as we see increasing cases and to also indicate to you the various aspects of the health sector, what our challenges are, so that it's very clear um, we were dealing with a health system with its constraints. And for St. Lucia, as the developed world and in the region, COVID-19 has put a new level of um, strain on everybody's existing health system. So we want to indicate to you what the challenges are and also indicate to you how we are managing and what plans we have moving forward to strengthen the system to bring that curve down. So we thought it important that we express this to you today, hence the reason why our entire team is here um, and some of our persons from the ground to explain to you how we are managing this wave. It will also give us an opportunity to clear up a lot of the misinformation that is out there that is causing a level of unnecessary anxiety and panic. So it is extremely important that um, anything that is not clear to your, your viewers, your listeners, it will give us an opportunity to present that information to you. And if there's any information that you would like cleared up, we are making ourselves available to provide that information um, to you. So our national epidemiologist will be giving you an update of the analysis of the St. Lucia situation um, to date. We'll give you an idea of the strains on the various um, health sector areas um, and how we are managing now, and also some information on the new variant that we have. We, we recently got information that we have um, present. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Belma. Now we'll have Dr. Gomez, who will give us an update on the current situation of COVID-19 in St. Lucia. Thank you. Good morning to all. Thank you, CMO. So we will start with a, a small update with um, what's going on in St. Lucia um, to present. Next slide. So currently we have 969 cases. Um, we have 461 active cases with 495 recoveries and 13 deaths. We have one individual who is currently critical in ICU. Next slide. Okay, so if we take a, a closer look, um, like we said in the previous slide, we have 969 cases with an incidence rate, which is really the, the rate that we have in new cases 
in our population at present. That is 53, is at 53.5. We have a percentage positivity of 4.2%. And uh, the case fatality, which is based on the number of deaths that we have to date, of 1.3%. If we take a closer look at the data and we look at what is going on from the past, for the past 14 days, which is from the 26th of January, which is yesterday, to the 13th of January, we had a total of 408 cases, averaging a number of cases per date of 29, with a daily infection rate of 16.1 as compared to the previous 14 days, which is from the 30th of December to the 12th of January, we had 206 cases. So we noticed that these cases have doubled during that period of time. And also the daily infection rate went from 8.1 between the 30th of December to the 12th of, of January, and right now it's at 16.1. Next slide. So if we do the weekly analysis, because we really want to show what exactly is going on. For up to the 31st of December, we had 353 cases. Then we went up to the 6th of January, having 380 cases. So minimal change. The incident risk, incidence rate went up from 19.5 to 21 between the, the 31st, 31st of December to January the 6th. Then we started seeing an increase as of the 13th of January with 502 cases with the incidence rate going up to 27.7. Then on the 21st of January, we have 755 cases with the incidence rate almost doubling at 41.7. And currently we are at 969. So we can see the great increase in cases which correlates with the increase in the incidence rate or the number of new cases that we are seeing currently um, in our population. Next slide. So this, when we look at our epide epidemiological curve, it's the same thing. Um, during the time of April, we had minimal cases. We experienced our first wave um, between October to November, obviously preceded by something during the, the time of October. Then the cases decreased, and uh, it was basically quiet. And uh, during December, we started seeing increases in cases up to now, where we have an exponential increase in cases. Next slide. So if we were comp to compare with the graph at the bottom, at the bottom um, in terms of the COVID-19 distribution by months, we would notice that you can make the comparison between December and January. So December, the number of cases in December is like almost three times or even more than three times the amount. Um, and January is almost more than three times the amount that we see in December. So this is the magnitude of the situation that we face, we're faced with right now. Um, again, in the, the graph above, um, confirmed cases by epidemiological weeks, um, which we, we, we saw in the epidemiological curve um, at week 40, which would correspond to the first week in October. Then we started seeing the, our first wave, which decreased the number of cases up to about the 5th, 5th of December thereabouts, um, which would correspond to week 49 and 50. After week 45, 49 and 50, which is correspond to the 5th of December, the 12th of December, we started seeing an increase in cases um, thereafter into the, the, the festive season. Next slide. Next slide. So of the cases that we have, um, what can we say about the cases? We have 55% of, of those cases are females. Um, the age range that is most affected, as we can see from the graph at the bottom, is the age range between 20 to, we can say 59. Um, the age range above 60 is affected, but not as much, which is one of the, the reasons, um, one of the, the reasons that affected our decision in, in having the tracking devices as to who we give the tracking devices. 
in the age range less than, than 20, we notice it's also been affected. But between 20 to 59, this is the age range where we, we see in most of our cases, as well as the gender um, being females are the ones, 55% of those presenting with um, the infection. Next slide. Up. Um, I missed the slide. I just wanted to um, say something on the deaths. I missed the slide there. Um, for the, the, the deaths, we've seen the, the age between 39 to 83 um, being affected. And um, we've seen that most of the deaths are between um, ages 45 to, to 80, um, where we have persons. At, at that time developing, um, which is the age range that you expect persons to have underlying conditions or to develop any underlying conditions. So this is the age range where we have most of our fatalities of all our deaths diagnosed. So looking at the health districts or the health regions, again, um, Castries is the region that is most affected, followed by Grosile and Pabuno. The graph to the top shows it uh, based on the incidence rate, which is how it should be calculated. And the graph at the bottom shows it based on the number of cases diagnosed per, per district. Um, right now, it's basically the same. So we have Castries, Grosile, Babuno, um, the same for incident rate, incidence rate as mm -hmm. for number of cases. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to touch on quarantine a bit and to show um, how quarantine has, uh, the, the lack of adherence to quarantine has been affecting and um, there, you can draw a correlation between persons not adhering to quarantine or breaches in quarantine and how that um, has affected our, our number of cases. So for November, so the blue um, is persons um, going to the hotel the orange is persons on home quarantine, and uh, the yellow is persons on facility quarantine. So for November, we see minimal persons going on home quarantine. In December, we have a large number, larger number of persons going on home quarantine. So if we look at the cumulative incidence of um, COVID-19 cases and the cumulative um, arrivals on home quarantine, we can see that as there has been an increase in persons going on home quarantine, so have we had an increase, an increase in our cases as well. So we can draw some degree of correlation between the two. Next slide. Um, this map also um, talks about the correlation between the two. Um, we've been able to plot where we've seen um, the majority of our cases. And also, so in the red, is the incidence or the positive cases that we see in, and the green and the different shades would um, let us know exactly where the, the quarantine cases have been. So we notice that we have the great, greater density in areas where we are seeing that persons are, are, are going for quarantine. If you look up in the north, um, we see the greater density of individuals going on home quarantine and also we see the greater density of cases being identified there. And uh, you can see a, a couple of spots in the south with the density, you can notice the, the darker green and the bigger circles are for the number of positive cases, hence drawing a correlation between the two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gomez, for this presentation. Before we go to Dr. Belma, we want to recognize the presence of the medical director of the Owen King EU Hospital and also the Respiratory Hospital, Dr. Alicia Eugene Ford, and also the Medical Office of Health, Dr. Glensford Joseph. We will now have Dr. Belma George to speak on the new variant and also adherence to protocols. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Neptune. 
Now, as Dr. Gomez has presented to you our epidemiological analysis to see how we know the increase in cases from the beginning and up to this point with a focus on the last few months, um, as, you, as you would imagine, the rapid increase in cases within a short period of time, this has affected um, our capacity to manage and it has also um, encouraged us to put new measures in place within a short period of time. Within our COVID-19 um, plan, this was one of the things that was included, the management of um, increased cases, that is the management of a surge. Um, I'll give you an example of one of the things that was in place to, to manage before. In our previous management of, of COVID-19, our admissions criteria, our discharge criteria um, as well, um, as Dr. Gomez indicated earlier, even our capacity for quarantine in the earlier stages, our policy in the, in the early days, everybody had to be kept within um, government quarantine, and that has kept us safe within our management. We had, during the month of December, over 1,500 persons coming in, which overwhelmed our capacity to be able to provide um, a more secure form of quarantine, so ho a, a model for home quarantine um, had to be put in place, which we got the breaches, we were aware of the breaches, has also, um, in, as we've indicated before, provided an extra risk to, to us getting new cases from persons who may not adhere. Um, some of the other issues that we have had to deal with is the vast numbers of persons coming to our respiratory clinics. Initially, we've been able to manage everyone coming. We set up five respiratory clinics to ensure access to care. That is the Groselet Polyclinic, the Leclerc Wellness Center, the Denry Hospital, the Soufre Hospital, and the Viewfort Wellness Clinics. As you note, the increased incidence of cases between Cashews and Groselet, we noted a lot of persons coming so we very quickly had to double up on our staffing. And we did have a week where the numbers were more than the staff could manage during that period. And as soon as we were alerted, we got the authority to increase the number of physicians and nurses to, to try to manage, and also to change some of the policies um, that occurred to reduce the numbers, one of those being our respiratory um, centers were the sites where um, for example, travelers, the new requirement for travelers um, needing a test, they would come to our respiratory clinics to get their test done. We had to quickly change that, train the medical staff at the hotel so that they can take the sample at the hotel and send it to our lab. So that way it reduced staff coming to, um, visitors coming to our respiratory clinics and further overwhelming the system. We've also indicated that um, the smaller um, guest houses, et cetera, would use their private physicians and different physicians to take those samples to reduce the number of persons coming so we can concentrate on persons coming in for care um, at the clinics. So these are some of the measures that we, we've had to, to put in place. And also when there are issues with the tourism sector, they use private physicians to to manage to take the sample so that less of, of both their staff and visitors would access go ahead would access our our clinics at the same time. Um, in terms of the respiratory hospital, I will Dr. Eugene will speak to how they've managed the increased cases coming in. And Dr. Felicia will also discuss the the testing issues. Dr. Gomez will speak to how we the new models that we have in place for, for home quarantine. And in the first phase of our management, all of our cases we kept within our institution for care. With the increasing numbers, and that was part of the plan to have various models for managing asymptomatic or persons who are very mild. So we had to, within short notice, go to the second module of isolation at home and set up clinical teams within the community to monitor those people and to liaise 
with the internist within the respiratory hospital on care to ensure that those persons are managed and transferred um, as needed. Um, in terms of, of where we are, Dr. Gomez mentioned that we had 13 COVID-related deaths. This is one of the issues I want to, to clear up. We term COVID-related deaths because we test persons who die for COVID-19. Our patients who've passed away, our people who've had, and I want to make it very clear, one death is too many. Our plan from very early was to contain the cases, reduce spread, because we are aware that we have a vulnerable population for COVID-19, and part of our plan is the strengthening of our patients with chronic diseases and our elderly to protect them, to reduce and to prevent them from getting sick because one death from COVID-19 is too many for us. So the 13 is too many. But we use the term COVID-related death. I want to make that very clear. I am at no point saying COVID killed somebody and I am not saying that nobody died of COVID. Our patients have other underlying conditions, our patients that we have had to date, a range of other underlying conditions which could have also caused their death. Now, it is a known fact that COVID-19 exacerbates an already existing health condition. It makes it worse. So I am not in a position to say COVID killed any one of them or to say it is not COVID. What, I, what we are saying, this person passed away and was positive with COVID-19. Okay, I hope that is clear um, when we use the term. I do not think that any of our patients to date have had only the COVID pneumonia and passed away. I think everyone had other conditions. The medical director can also clear this up. But I just thought that we make it very clear. Now, in terms of the, the new, the UK variant, that is B117 um, variant, if you would recall, I think it was December 14th when the Public Health Agency of the UK um, made it public, the, this new variant. Now, just for you to know, um, at least six variants have already emerged of COVID-19. And COVID-19 is not behaving any different to viruses. Viruses are simple organisms. They are known to mutate frequently so this is not unusual. Just as we see influenza mutates every year, every year we need a new influenza vaccine. It's a similar case that's happening with COVID-19 where it mutates, it changes, and some of the characteristics of the virus um, also change. So in December, we were alerted, the world was alerted on this new variant. What they noted on the variant, and let me also indicate that, they also made it clear that this variant was circulating from September. So it was a lot of months when this variant was already, um, already existed. So what the analysis indicated, this most likely is already everywhere. We were alerted in December, but it was already everywhere since September. So that's like four months that it was, uh, the countries were open. So um, the likelihood, the risk of it being in other countries was very high, and some countries quickly started testing and noted that they did have it in circulation. Of significance of this variant that they noted was the fact that the transmissibility was high, 70% more. So that is when, for example, we would note with one person getting COVID, we get one or two cases. If it is easier to be transmitted, it means for every one case, we expect to see more persons um, developing the, the illness. The, in what the research is showing to date is that the form of the disease is not more severe. That is, it is affecting people the same way. So the death rate is not more. The signs and symptoms are not more severe. It is not killing people more. People are not suffering more with it. The only change that they have noted at this point in the research is that, that it is transmitted faster. Now, of significance for us as public health persons, the first thing we ask, will our PCR test pick up COVID? Has it changed significantly that we can't pick it up? 
and our PCR testing, it allows us to get a positive for COVID. But within the region, there isn't the capacity to do the gene sequencing to test for the new variant. So um, in December, we're quite um, proactively, the director of COFA, Dr. St. John, called an emergency meeting of all of the agencies for the region to have a discussion on how we move forward for the region. And this is where um, COFA indicated that they will accept samples when we get positive tests with very high viral loads. They gave the countries an allocation that we can send, and it has to meet a certain um, condition for it to be sent over to them so that they can test. Now, so St. Lucia, as with the other um, islands, took the opportunity, and um, some samples were sent from our positives in December, because remember, it was in December that this came, this information was shared with us. CAFA facilitates the countries. CAFA is not able to do the gene sequencing, and they outsource it on behalf of countries. So there is a delay in countries getting the results. I had indicated in previous press conferences that we had sent samples to COFA and that we were waiting. On Sunday, we received those results from COFA on the presence of this variant. And on Monday, as we, we try within 24 hours to provide the public and the press with information, this information was shared with us on Sunday. And then on Monday, we provided that information to to the public as we try to do as much as possible within 24 um, hours. The other information that we have received in relation to the new variant is that the vaccines that have been produced and approved are effective against the new variant. So this was the other concern that we had, that being that this is a new um, variant, we were concerned, and it has been indicated to us at this stage that the vaccines are effective um, against the, the new variant. So um, I really want to acknowledge the support from our public health agencies because in a timely manner, COFA provided us with an avenue to, to be tested. And um, this is something we expected given that it was, this variant was already there since September, but at least it gave us the capacity to test. And um, the virologist from WHO has already indicated that he, he will be, in, he'll be liaising with Dr. Felicia to assist us in developing the capacity for gene sequencing. So that is already on its way. So it will provide us with an opportunity, not just for the new variant, but for other um, infectious diseases within our, our public um, lab. So I think this is it for me for, for the updates on at this stage. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharon Bernard-George, for this comprehensive information. Before we move to Dr. Felicia, we will like Dr. Gomez to provide us with information on home isolation measures currently being undertaken for case management. And also, um, she'll also speak on the rollout of the monitoring devices. Okay. So as Dr. Um, Belmer alluded to earlier on, we've started, we've begun um, isolating persons at home. However, for the isolation of individuals at home, um, there is, must be a certain criteria that must be met. Um, ideally, it would, the individuals would have to have their own um, rooms and their own, their own bedroom and a bathroom um, allotted to them at home. Of course, as with every situation, um, we assess the, the, the situation, uh, whoever's doing the assessment, we assess it in order to, and we work around with the, the, the situation or the conditions that that persons have. As with everything, you will have challenges. But we have set up um, teams, medical monitoring teams, in order to assess individuals who are in home, home isolation. And mostly it would be individuals who are asymptomatic or persons who have very mild symptoms who we believe will not decompensate whilst at home. 
um, under other circumstances with persons who are who, who we monitor and we believe are not doing well at home, then we have capacity within the hospital to send them in for, for treatment. Now, the purpose of isolation basically is to contain the disease. Um, home isolation does not come with, without its challenges because persons who may be asymptomatic, like we said, these are the individuals that we are targeting for home isolation, persons who are asymptomatic or who have mild symptoms. Um, if they are not feeling well, then obviously they will find it difficult to stay within the homes. So we are, we are asking the public that um, with this new model that we're introducing, we will be having with persons monitoring individuals on a daily basis, and we'll also be having the medical teams who will go out to the homes to do the assessments of, of these individuals. Um, but we're asking persons also to comply with the, the adherence of, of the, the measures and to, to remain um, within isolation. We also would like to um, thank the, the public because they've been very vigilant. We are getting messages. They're calling the lines. They're calling 311. They're calling the epidemiology unit when they have cited persons that have been in breach of um, quarantine and also if they have been in breach of isolation. And um, together with the Royal St. Lucia Police Force and other stakeholders, we have been able to get these persons and bring them into care once there is any breach of um, any of our protocols. In terms of the, um, the monitoring devices, which we'll introduce on the 18th of July, um, it is something new to, to the public. There has been a mixed reaction um, in terms of the, the reception, but overall it has been, uh, I could say, looking at, at the, the situation, it has been received well. Um, persons are complying, persons are um, purchasing the, the devices and they're wearing it. But like I said, it's a new, it's a new process and it's anything that's new will come with with its challenges okay um based on the we have certain age range and we have persons that we we that are exempt from wearing the devices and this is based on what we see with the epi pattern or the behaviors that we seen we are seeing on ground um so we we asking persons to be patient with us as we roll out these devices and there will be delays um, persons will be frustrated we have been getting um, feedback from the ports of entry as as to how frustrated persons can be but it is a new process and we are trying our best to um, remedy the, um, the situation so we ask persons to be patient and we've all we're also aware of um, some of the verbal abuse that the persons at the ports of entry, the staff at the ports of entry have encountered as a result of this. But we know persons are, can be frustrated. You come from a long flight, you may be tired, you may, be, you may have children, but like I said, it's a new process and we do ask and we implore the public to be patient with us as we um, try to roll out this. Because based on the, what we've seen and what I just um, spoke to and alluded to in the presentation, it is important that persons adhere to the protocols and the quarantine measures in order for us to curb and to try to limit the spread of, of the disease in St. Lucia presently. Thank you, Dr. Gomez. So, of course, you spoke on the two devices, which was rolled out on January 18th. That is the bio IntelliSense bio button and also the Amber Research. And we're asking persons to cooperate and to Take you, make use of these um, devices. Now we will move on to Dr. Felicien, who would speak on testing, um, the current situation as it relates to um, testing capacity. Also, um, the reason why they would use, um, put priority for travel and also high risk. Hi, hello, good morning, everybody. I'd like to first congratulate everyone here, sitting here with me, on the fantastic job that they've been doing. I know they've been having sleepless nights, working hard and tirelessly, developing strategies where we can best handle this pandemic 
something that's known for overwhelming systems, persons, and creating a lot of anxiety within the population. Um, the Ezra Long Lab from March of 2020 started developing and started doing testing for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And through that entire period, we've developed processes and improved our capacity. When we initially started our turnaround time, our time from sampling to time of delivery of result, extended from seven to at times 14 days. We were able to bring that down in the months of June, July, and through even the initial weeks of January to 24 hours, 12 to 24 hours consistently, at least delivery of the results to the, to the Ministry of Health and to the general public within three to four days, just more due to clerical issues and the way we send out the results. So that level of consistency assisted in decreasing the level of anxiety within the population. With this surge, which is almost consistently high, with the daily numbers being within the 30s to 50s, um, we've been finding that we've been getting a lot more sample and this has increased our turnaround time to almost four days. Um, it's forced us to look at our processes from sample collection at the various sites, from reception of samples, from the mere processing, the analytical aspect of it, and then the delivery of it, and just look at every single system and see where we can develop efficiencies and how we can reduce that and bring it back to the 12 to 24 hours that we've had. The team has taken on different strategies, so we should see that decreasing within the next few days, hopefully by next week so, we should see it going back to what we've been accustomed to delivering and reducing the anxiety level. Um, to note, we've processed almost 25 samples within St. Lucia, and 62% of that over the last four months, a substantial amount, approximately 15,000. And the large majority of the positives have come over that period as well. So we have our challenges. We're trying to overcome them. We've done, we've already started implementing some of those strategies to reduce it. And there should be some changes noted within the next few days. Um, we also have, as Ms. Neptune points, there are ranks of priority. And when we say ranks of priority, we know that everybody is a priority. And, but there are persons who are more severely ill and it affects also different workplaces, the workflow at the hospital, persons who are traveling. So we try to organize some level of priority for these people. Um, but we push through as much as possible. Um, to date, we process almost between 250 to 300 samples per day. That should increase over the next 24 to 48 hours. So we should see increased numbers. And as those numbers increase, hopefully we can see that some of the strategies that the Epidemiological Department, Ministry of Health, and other government agencies have implemented should reduce the number of positives we, we should, that should be coming our way. Um, CAFA has provided support for us throughout this testing process. And the gene sequencing is another component that they've added. They outsourcing it from what Dr. Bellman just referred. And that means that they're sending it to us a reference lab that can. We are going to be in discussion with PAHO, with the virologist, Lionel Gresh, to see how we can develop that capacity on island. So that's some level of training that we're going to undergo. And hopefully we could start detecting other variants apart from the, the UK variant or whatever other variants that exist within our society. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Felicia. But before we move on to Dr. Belma, perhaps you can speak on the value of the COVID-19 PCR test um, compared to the antigen test. Um, when we started with the detection of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the PCR test was initially what existed and was confirmatory. And by PCR, it means it, it is able to detect part of the virus's RNA or fabric of the virus. And the human body then can respond to that level of infection 
by developing what we call antibodies that fight. Antibodies then develop after a period of time, seven to 10 days. So they then developed an antibody test which exists. And then we do know that the body, most of our cells develop what we call an antigen or protein on the cells, which proves that you have some, com you had an infection. So they developed an antigenic test. Now these tests are reliable up to a certain percentage. Um, so we have to be mindful in the use of it. The, like any test, it always depends on the quality of the sampling that is done. It also depends on the patient's, the exact time in which the patient is in the infection. So they can be used, but they need to be interpreted um, properly so they can be used properly. So the SARS-CoV-2, the PCR, is definitely the confirmatory test. Um, the antigenic test is a test that can detect um, where the large majority of the positives are true positives, but some of the negatives almost, some of the negatives have to be confirmed still. So you will find yourself having to do one test and do another test. And there's always the argument whether you just go for one rather than do two or three tests just to confirm it. So in the physician world within St. Lucia, we, we're at discussions to see which is the best strategy to approach this. Um, we know, do know that the antigenic tests and serological tests are out there in Zen Russia, but we need to educate ourselves and the public at its proper use. What do we do when we have the different results and what happens? You might do one test and have to do another test. One test being negative now, whether it be the antigenic, the PCR, or the serological test, does not mean that you cannot get exposed 24 hours or five minutes later and then develop a test later. So we need to be mindful that we educate ourselves, we educate the public, and we approach the whole diagnostic of this properly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Joseph. I will now call on Dr. Alicia Eugene, who will speak on the revised um, discharge policy and also the capacity at the respiratory hospital. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Just so that persons know, we now have a, uh, we've changed our, we've now used, we're now using our, um, the new WHO CDC guidelines um, when it comes to discharging. And that, these guidelines came out in this January the 18th um, of this year. So you realize that persons actually spend less time in the hospital um, or isolated, whether it's at home or in the hospital. Of course, WHO would have made these changes supported by science. So we're looking at for symptomatic patients, that's for COVID-19 patients, we're looking at 10 days after the onset of symptoms, plus at least three days without symptoms. And that would include symptoms like fever and also without respiratory symptoms. And for asymptomatic patients, that's for COVID-19, you 10 days after you've gotten the positive um, COVID-19 test. I need to make it clear that even though persons are clear for COVID-19, doesn't mean that they may not need to stay more time in hospital because persons don't only come for COVID-19. You may have a patient who came in who has COVID-19, a positive test or feeling unwell, but they do have other comorbidities. So once we have cleared this person and we've, tell that we've told them that they're no longer COVID-19 positive, we would have to um, transfer that person to OKUH for them to be managed for the other comorbidities because we cannot discharge you until you actually stay able to go out. Uh, that person might go to OKUH, they might opt to go to St. Jude's Hospital because they're from the South. And in some cases, persons might want to go to the private hospital, Tapio Hospital. Okay. Um, we also have the rest of the beds. I think we had 44 beds, if I remember clearly, 44 beds we had pending. And this has been handed over to us about two weeks ago. So now we're looking at a, a bed capacity of 126 beds at the respiratory hospital. And of course, we have divisions of negative, positive, and suspect cases. We have to separate them. We also have a particular ward for TB because we do not want to make our TB cases, which are respiratory cases with COVID-19 cases. So that is a separation that is very much important. And um, other than that, I think um, in addition to the, uh, just want to let persons know that in addition to the extra beds, 
you'd obviously need extra staffing and then arrangements are already being made to bring in extra nurses, extra physicians, um, the, the clinical support staff, the porters, the domestics, all of these are in, in is, is happening already in the pipeline. So we, it's a situation where changes are being made slowly to accommodate the increase in patients that are coming in. Thank you very much. I will now call on Dr. Belma George to give us some closing remarks. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Neptune. Um, as we indicated um, through our various team members, we are noting the increases in cases and we are adjusting the system to manage the patients in a safe way and to continue in terms of the surveillance within the communities and also to contain. One of the things I forgot to indicate that later this week we'll also be including two other hotels um, as isolation and also as quarantine units to assist us in, in containment and isolation um, of persons. Once this starts, we'll provide you with, the, with that information, but we are already preparing to start off um, with two new facilities to assist us to manage the increases. We, from the Ministry of Health, we understand um, the level of concern and anxiety that is out there. However, we, what we are advising um, the public and also you as media houses and important stakeholders and partners is to ensure that the information that is provided um, supports the Ministry of Health to ensure we can get proper behavior change as we move forward. What is going on in St. Lucia is not unusual even in the developed world. A lot of what we are experiencing now is the same that has happened even in developed countries and in the region with the increasing numbers and the, the, the backlog of cases that we are seeing um, with our neighboring islands and the increases at the, at the clinics. But that is not an excuse to, to relax and hence why we are implementing measures to manage the increases in a very um, safe way. As much as we understand the concern and the anxiety that is out there, as a country, we need to maintain um, the focus. In previous um, reviews and updates, I have outlined all of the risks that we have faced and all of the risks that we still face for community spread. They are still here and they all still exist. But for us as a country, we need to maintain our focus on what do we need to do at this point to bring our curve down. We note there are two things that we, we continue to see, which is increasing the number of persons when we do contact tracing. One, persons with respiratory signs and symptoms. If you have respiratory signs and symptoms, you can visit our um, respiratory clinics that are indicated. I also want to indicate that we have set up an outpost based on the high incidence that we've seen in the north at the VG complex where persons can come in for health education to be seen, to be tested as well. That's one of the, the new measures that we have put in place to deal with the, the increases. If you have signs and symptoms, do not go to workplaces. Do not go to social activities. Do not visit family. This is leading to us getting so many more positive cases per person. And this is extremely important because while you're symptomatic, the possibility of transmission is a lot higher. So we are pleading for persons with respiratory signs and symptoms, or if you're not feeling well, avoid public places. This is one measure which will really assist us in controlling this curve at this point. The other issue we have, like we came out, as soon as we noted the increase in cases for testing and we noted that we were falling behind in our 24, 48 hour target, we informed the public of this. This is a challenge that we are facing and we let the public know that there is now a delay. If you have been tested for COVID-19, 
you need to stay home in quarantine or isolation until you get a call of your result. We have delays in giving the results. Do not assume that you are negative and leave. Wait until you get confirmation before leaving. So anyone doing a test should not be out in public places. This is extremely important. Wait, we are experiencing delays, but wait until you get your result before going out, before socializing, and before going to work. This is creating another issue for us with persons, some persons symptomatic, and they are going out, putting other people um, at risk. The other very important point that we need to, to highlight, um, action on our part, personal responsibility. It is very easy to blame visitors, to blame illegal people, to blame home quarantine. We see all the blame going around. It is not a point for us here to blame. It is a point for action. And every single one of us have to take personal responsibility. If we don't do it for ourselves, we need to do it for our families, because we all have vulnerable people within our family. This is where we live. This is where we work. Our actions, because at the phase we are, in the early part of January, we were seeing a lot of people who attended um, social activities. At this point, we are getting their families and their friends and their workplaces. So we have people who did everything right. And it's not about blaming, but people who did everything right and have a relative who did not and get it innocently. Let us take a level of personal responsibility, especially this week with our um, reduction in activities. This is how we break the chain of transmission, by reducing the movement. We have seen with an increase in social activities, we always get an increase in cases. This curve, we can bring it down if we work together and if we do the responsible thing. And this is where we need to focus, because we'll get through this, this wave, and it will not be our last wave. We anticipate managing several waves during 2021. But the timing at which we can bring this wave down a lot faster with personal responsibility in terms of us not socializing, ensuring we wear our mask in public places, and the director of health education is sitting at the back. They've used every single medium available to speak to the public on what we can do to keep ourselves and our families um, safe. I think everybody in St. Lucia knows about hand washing, how to wear a mask, and physical distancing. These are basic, easy measures, and the social activities that put us at risk. So more than ever, as we are at this critical juncture, we really need the support of the public. And you, the media, stakeholders, we really need your support to drive that message home for you, your family, and for all of us um, here. Let us leave the panic, let us leave the anxiety, and let us stay focused on what we need to do at this point to, to manage this, this, this curve that we are seeing here. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now take a few questions from the media. First, if you could please state your name and your organization. So much Alfred is here. Okay, my question is in regards to the new variant. Um, you said that it's 70% more transmissible. I'm just asking you, are our tried and true measures adequate given that it's a more infectious disease? Um, yes, the new variant, the transmissibility is what is increased. The physical, the social and infection prevention control measures are still the measures that's advised to, to manage um, countries with the new variant. So the same way, um, staying a, a, a safe distance from other persons and putting your mask, these are the same measures to, to prevent and to reduce transmission. Um, the, unlike, the, uh, unlike the other 12 COVID-related deaths, there was one patient without a, a medical history who did test positive and subsequently passed away. Uh, has that 
individual's cause of death been established or determined yet? That's an issue. Could you say the remedy? To me, everybody had underlying conditions. There was. There was. Oh, I, I'm. There was a press release that said no medical history. But I wasn't sure. Oh, but what does that mean? Um, no medical. His no medical history. That was um, the, one of the first press releases this month to do with the um, COVID related death. My apologies for not um, having. She said sure. there was one. No, no medical history. At the time. At the time, yeah. Um, I don't know exactly which case you're speaking about, but in terms of even the cases that have medical or known medical conditions, we still examine them total in its totality to ascertain. And there are cases that we, oh, regardless if you have any comorbidity, the circumstances under which you die, we'd have to do post-mortems on. So. Yeah. If I knew which case you were talking about, I could tell you, give you a bit yeah. much better this information. But it's yeah. like these seven deaths, 69-year-old yeah. male yeah. from this, Georgia. Right, right. Mrs. Right. Lloyd just clarified. This was somebody who I think passed away at home. At the time of reporting, we did not know the cause of death. But subsequently, it was known. She just indicated that we had one when we reported. We were not aware and reported that we did not know. But that was at the time of reporting. It was subsequently identified what the... The, the health conditions were. So you are correct. We, we did report it, but. Um, so this, this individual did have some COVID. Yes, so there was an issue. Okay. Yeah. Apologies, I did not remember. I guess I just thought of what came after the update. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, Nelsia Charmant, Troy TV. CMO, Dr. Felicia, in terms of a backlog in cases, I know you said we are putting some things in place to deal with that, but can we just be a little more specific as to what the measures are to deal with the backlog? Because we saw a few days ago the 76 cases was between like a seven-day period. So how are we dealing with that specifically? Um, it depends on how specific you want me to be. <laughs> I can tell you from moving a cabinet to moving a, a draw. <laughs> but what we've done is bring in more clerical people, um, bring in more technical people to do the testing process, um, try to get more workstations in terms of computers, um, things that can actually make the process go a lot quicker. Um, so essentially that, and try to Im increase the working hours without um, of what we've avoided in burnout. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Morning to all. Rochelle Gonzalez, Fox 7 TV. Employees from different sectors have been reaching out to the media in desperation as a last resort for help, as their employers are threatening to terminate their jobs if they miss work to self-quarantine. As you stated, you advise people who are waiting their results to stay at home. So, um, Bas or basically, if they refuse to um, execute tasks where they feel that they are being exposed to the virus. So with that said, what do you have to say about this situation? What message do you have to employers to perhaps dissuade them from this behavior? And finally, what message do you have for employees going through this? Do you want to answer it or you want to answer Um, persons who are tested, persons who are in quarantine, persons who are in isolation are provided with a sick leave during that period where they stay at home. The public is once again advised that if you are unwell, if you have been tested, if you are in home quarantine for whatever reason, you are to stay in during the period of that of that time. This is a public, we are dealing with a public health um, issue. When you go out, you're putting your co-workers, you're putting whoever you go on the bus with, you're putting a number of persons um, at risk, which would have a greater um, effect on, on, on the workflow if more persons become exposed. So the Ministry of Health, we work with a number of um, employees, including the chamber. Um, we will be sharing the guidelines, which was prepared by the epidemiology unit, um, with them. 
on the risks based on um, ill employees. That's one of the things I forgot to do as it came up. I will be sharing that with them, but it is extremely important. The health and safety of the workers has to be the priority. And if we are to contain and reduce spread within the workplace, it is extremely important that persons with signs and symptoms stay at home or get medical care. Question: What is the procedure when a COVID-19 business place or commercial house has someone who has a confirmed case of COVID-19? Um, is that commercial house supposed to close That's down shop that. and um, do a deep sanitization, or simply is that person removed as well as their immediate contacts around them? And secondly, we understand that some business places have taken it on themselves to perform rapid tests. Is that advisable? Okay. So once we have an individual who's a confirmed case, that notification reaches the AP unit. Um, the contact tracer's job is to contact the individual who has been confirmed. And we do ask the confirmed case to um, notify the employer of their status. We then get the number of contacts or persons that they may have been in contact with at the workplace. And through the employer, normally the HR, um, sometimes the manager, they call us and we have this rapport with them. And uh, we are able to ask the individuals who they've been in contact with to be quarantined and uh, to, go, to go in for testing, depending on the last date of contact with the confirmed case. Because um, in some instances, the confirmed case hasn't been there for quite some time. So we have to go back a bit. Um, like Dr. Belma alluded to, Everyone who has been swabbed is provided with a sick leave to cover them for the, the period of time that they will be out of work. And the sick leave is a legal document. Um, in some instances, the employers have asked us for the, the, the confirmed case. I'm just going off a, li a little bit. Mm -hmm. The confirmed case results. We are not in any position to give anybody's results. At the end of the period of isolation of the confirmed case, we do issue a letter saying that this individual has been confined for a certain period of time. It is signed by one of our um, medical officers. Um, and that is a legal document. The sick leave is also given to the confirmed case, and that sick leave is also a legal document for the period of time that that individual. So they're given two documents, basically, a sick leave and a discharge from isolation letter in the event that they do need it. So these two are legal documents. And there is no reason why the employer should be asking of us or be asking of the employee that is returning to work their, 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 their negative results. Having said that, um, once we've communicated with the institution that the, 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 they have a confirmed case in the workplace, we get the contacts, they're swabbed, they're quarantined for the period of time pending re receipt of, of their results and also pending the, the, the time, which is the 14 days, which is the incubation period, which has not changed up to now. It still continues to be 14 days from the last date of contact with the confirmed case. In some instances, we do ask the employers to, um, to do a deep cleaning because at this time, you have persons in the workplace, there is a lot of anxiety, there is a lot of emotions running because there is a confirmed case. However, persons at the workplace are supposed to be adhering to measures whilst at the workplace. I know in, in many institutions, they have implemented measures, which is the three measures that we always talk about the hand washing, the face mask, the frequent sanitization of the, the surfaces. We have seen persons they're passing around in institutions and cleaning up and sanitizing after them. So these are the measures that should, they should be put in place. We have spoken about the, our position on the antigen test and how it can be, which Dr. Felicia spoke to about, it can give you um, false negatives and it can give you um, a false sense of security because of the specificity and the sensitivity of that test and what it detects and when it detects. Persons have called the EPI unit. They have called 31111, sorry, 311, <laughs> saying that they have a confirmed case in their workplace. We now have to ask them whether that individual has had a an antigen test, because we know that a lot of workplaces, 
a lot of the employees are going out and doing the antigen test. So we have to ask them whether it is an antigen test or whether it is a DNA PCR, which is the gold standard for diagnosis of um, COVID-19. We want persons to know that if it is an antigen test that is positive, they should get their PCR done to confirm. It is pretty similar to an HIV test. You do a rapid in the field, you have to confirm with an ELISA to ensure that you are really positive. So this is our situation and this is the stance of the Ministry of Health as it pertains to antigen testing and a confirmed case in the workplace. Um, the Ministry has done an excellent job as, as far as driving home the message as, uh, as, as far as the protocols are concerned, social distancing and re 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 limiting social activity. But I wanted to ask about the, uh, the protocols last year. Some of them were relaxed a bit for the Christmas and New Year's. Considering the third wave and the rate of infection today or this month, was that decision medically appropriate? I can answer. Um, throughout the year from March, we use our epidemiological analysis to amend the protocols and the policies as we move forward. What we use is the data coming out in terms of the rate of increase of cases, and that is a discussion that happens at the level of the command center. This is then taken to the wider NEMAC um, grouping, which includes a wide cross-section um, of services across society. During December, we, we noted a reduction of the rate of increase of cases. And in discussion with the wider team, a decision was made to relax some of the measures. I think the main one that was, we went from, I think a group of, group we allowed family activities during the season. I think that was the main measure that was taken, if my memory is right. So we did reduce. But what was put in place, because our greatest gap, our greatest um, issue that we have seen throughout the year of implementing those policies is the enforcement of those policies. So uh, a policy is put out, an SI is put out, but in terms of getting adherence on compliance on the ground, um, this really has been our biggest issue. So. The, the biggest problem we saw during December was not the change in the policies because if they were still restrictive. They still allowed very small groups. There are certain things that we've stopped to reduce the crowding, like the fireworks, etc. We canceled all staff parties and all activities. We, we stopped a lot of the, the social activities um, associated with the season. But what we noted, which put us at great risk during the month of December, was the non-adherence to, to home quarantine and the non-adherence to these very same um, policies. There were many um, big parties. There was crowding within the cities. There was a lot of um, big groups within shops and outside. We got a lot of different activities um, happening, which we were able to pick up through the contact tracing process that we saw in January. So I think there was some level of relaxation of measures into the December month, but the biggest issue was the non-compliance of the measures that were put in place um, during that month. And I think you're aware of the limitations that exist with trying to enforce um, on the ground um, in all of those various communities. I think all of you live here in St. Lucia. All of you were able to see what was going on with the level of activities while we live in a COVID environment. Okay. Um, my final question, still on testing capacity. Is the Ezra Long Lab the only lab in St. Lucia with the capacity to do PCR testing? And if not, can we delegate some of the testing to private labs, possibly? For specifically PCR yeah. testing. Um, I will just touch on one, and I will let Dr. Felix here um, deal with testing. One of the decisions that has been made to relieve the load on our Ezra Long Lab 
is the exit testing. A decision has been made that the, the exit testing, because at least two developed countries um, accept antigen testing. So this um, a decision has been taken that the private labs will be allowed to do that for persons for exit travel. But I will let Dr. Felicia, who's the lab director, explain the situation in relation to that. Um. Just to speak on PCR testing and any test in um, any laboratory or um, institution deemed a laboratory would have to mean certain requirements from a safety, from a technical perspective, from an HR perspective, and also from a legislative perspective. So um, I don't think we've restricted any other lab from, but it would be more that once they can meet the necessary requirements that they send in an application to the Ministry of Health and once they can meet the requirements and they're able to assist with the workload, I don't see any issues. Okay, let me, let me clear up. Um, Go ahead, okay. Um, Ms. Neptune just wanted me to clear something up. In the plan for COVID-19 that we did, one of the things that I wanted to, to also clear up, which Ms. Neptune reminded me, because we have been getting a lot of calls and there's been a lot of misinformation. The Ministry of Health has not prevented any private practitioner from managing patients with respiratory symptoms or seeing COVID-19 patients. Some practitioners are managing those privately, some are not. This is a decision of the private practitioner, so the public is required to call a private practitioner to see if they will be seen or not. But we have ensured that we have set up a set of accessible clinics throughout the island for anybody who needs care for respiratory signs and symptoms. Physicians are also able to take the swab within their private office and send it down. So everybody does not have to go to a respiratory clinic. You can check your private. I, I know that is a, some misinformation where people think the private sector is not allowed to see. There are private physicians who have been managing and see those mm -hmm. patients, but the public should call their private physician to find out if they can go there, if they could get tested there and not if they don't feel comfortable coming to one of our um, respiratory um, clinics. And it has been the, the policy of the government to ensure that COVID-19 treatment and care is free of charge to the public. So we do not charge for the visit. We do not charge for the test. And the test, Dr. Felicia will tell you, costs in excess of 150 US per test. That has been provided free of charge um, to the public. When it comes to testing, I think there is something that um, the public needs to understand why certain decisions are taken. A disease such as COVID-19 with all of its implications, the clinical team, and I rely on the team from the Ezra Long lab to request and to guide as to what they want in making their diagnosis. A decision of positive or negative determines whether someone is released back into society freely. So you must understand the importance of us as clinical persons to ensure that whatever test is being used is able to give us that level of confidence in terms of the results because it is going to allow us to make um, a very important decision as to who stays in hospital and who may be allowed to go home and, and mingle. So I found it important that, that the, the testing discussion, that that point is also um, taken into consideration. Because just imagine if um, someone who works with you or lives with you has to do a test, you'd want to know that if we re release that person to go back, that there is a good enough percentage in terms of the accuracy of the result that was given. Thanks. We have no more questions from the media, but we also have Dr. Eugene who would like to speak on a matter. Just wanted to add to what Mr. Isidore had. Uh, 
I just wanted to add to what, well, he stepped out, Mr. Riani Isidore had asked um, about the COVID-related deaths we had and whether these individuals had any comorbidities. I just wanted to state that even though these individuals did have comorbidities, we have to, I do not want persons to think that because I do not have a comorbidity, I should not worry because, you know, nothing's really going to happen to me. This is a new disease and um, we are still studying it, not only locally, but it's actually being studied on an international level. We have to look at complications that may exist. So it's a situation where just because you don't have a comorbidity, but you got ill, okay, I did not die, doesn't mean that you don't, we, you, you later on, you, you already know what's going to happen later on because it's a new disease and persons are still falling up, persons who have recovered from the disease to see their complications. So we just want to make sure that persons don't feel okay, I'm okay, and I don't have any comorbidities. So nothing really is going to happen to me. I'm just going to ride that illness. It may not be there, at, it, not, it may not be so at all. Also, we have to look at the health-seeking behavior in St. Lucia. A lot of persons really, I know women tend to go to the hospital or the clinics or the private physician very often because um, that is how women usually do. They get pregnant, they feel unwell, they go to the doctor. Um, but uh, sometimes men don't really do that. They may very well wait until they're very ill. So somebody may be walking around and they don't even know they have a comorbidity. They may have the high blood pressure, they may have diabetes, they may have another illness and they, they say, oh, my pressure goes up sometimes. I think sometimes I feel unwell, but they never really go, went to check. So we, we, we have to be careful when we say that we are okay and we don't have any problems, but sometimes we do have a comorbidity that may be captured when you're actually admitted mm -hmm. or go to the hospital and you do blood tests and you realize, oh my God, I'm actually ill and I was not aware. So I just want persons to, to not think that because I don't have a comorbidity that I'm okay. Lastly, I think that's one of the pointers we may have missed, and I'm just going to put it in there. Um, one of the ways in which the Ministry of Health has worked towards um, building up our capacity to deal with cases that are COVID-19 positive, we do have patients on home isolation. In the absence of my colleague who is not here, Dr. Shana Siu, who is the Senior Medical Officer for the um, Primary Health Care Services, I could tell you that they're working along with the, hospital, with the hospital to develop community teams, where they have teams in the north and teams in the south, they're working to make these teams more robust. We have worked along with that primary health care department to allow them to know what criteria um, of patients um, should stay home, clinical criteria, who should stay home and who should be referred to the hospital. So with the teams being on board, you know, they're working on it, um, we will be able to see um, out of X number of persons, how many persons that are home isolated, in our home isolation, and which of these individuals we have to keep an eye on. So that information will be constantly shared with us at the hospital so that if a patient is removed from home isolation and quickly has to be admitted at the hospital, it would not be a new case for us. It would be a case that we'd be already be informed of their comorbidities or if they're unwell, et cetera. And then when they come to the hospital, it is something that we're already anticipating or we'd already known about that case. Okay, so it's a joint effort between departments under the Ministry of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eugene Ford. While we have come to the end of the press conference on the COVID-19 virus, I want to thank members of the media for participating and also the panel for providing us with such information, very important information. On behalf of the entire production team at the Ministry of Health, I am Fennel Neptune. Thanks for watching.